Hello and welcome to The Painting Podcast. I'm your host, Jeremiah Polachek, your co-pilot on the pathway to becoming a better painter. Today we're going to be talking about French Rococo painter. Oh no. Rococo. No. Rococo. Okay. Today we're going to be talking about French Rococo painter Fragonard. I hate Fragonard's work. But let this be an exercise in art appreciation. So I'm going to dig into Fragonard, what makes him tick, and perhaps my opinion will be changed by the end of the podcast. Let's get into it. So we need to start off with the idea that your opinion doesn't matter. My opinion on Fragonard doesn't matter. Your opinion on any work of art does not matter. Why doesn't it matter? It doesn't matter because your opinion doesn't change the historical context that was present uh, when the work was created. What was happening when it was created? Your opinion doesn't change the technical mastery or innovation that an artist employs when creating a work. Your opinion has no bearing on the influence of an artist on other artists and movements, and your opinion has no relation to the symbolism or narrative depth that may lie within a work. And your opinion doesn't matter because you probably have a lot of personal biases as well. So we can start off by just erasing this notion that your opinion somehow matters when judging artwork. It doesn't matter. You can say, I don't like it. Okay, fine. I don't care. I said, I don't like Fragonard. That has no bearing on Fragonard's work at all. Okay? So let's start off there uh, with your opinion doesn't matter. Always a good teaching moment for people to realize that. And let's get into Fragonard and see if, you know, my own personal biases start bubbling up to the surface as I learn more about Fragonard and uh, what was going on when he started making these paintings and what, what triggers me when I see a Fragonard so much. So here's the absolute basics on where we need to get started in dissecting this work. Fragonard was born on April 5th, 1732 in France, and he studied at the French Royal Academy of Painting and Sculpture, where he was a pupil of François Boucher, who is a, a prominent Rococo painter. But his pathway to Boucher was a little bit tumultuous because he was brought to him, uh, Fragonard was brought to Boucher when Fragonard was 18 years old, and basically he said, okay, yeah, this kid, this kid can, can draw and paint, he's okay, uh, but I, I don't really have time for this. So have him study with Chardin. And Chardin is great. I love Chardin. I, I just love it. You, you know, just stick to painting, still lifes, and uh, some like maids and stuff like this. That's a lot better. I, I can deal with that. But anyway, so Fragonard uh, goes and studies with Chardin. Study, uh, look up some of his images on your phone. C-H-A-R-D-I-N is how you spell his name. And he goes and studies with him for a year or so before coming back to Francoise Boucher, who is this prominent Rococo painter who's much better known for painting portraits of rich people in aristocracy. And why was he making so many paintings of rich people at the time? Well, it was because he was the court painter for Louis XV. And it's important to understand what exactly is a court painter? What would they do? You hear about this all the time. We have a lot of famous painters throughout history who were court painters. So what did they actually do? Well, a court painter would have a variety of different responsibilities. One of them would simply be portraiture. So you got to make portraits of the royal family and nobles and all these sorts of people just to put around the house. Then they have to make decorative works. So these could be things like tapestries or murals or ceiling paintings, all this sort of things. And a lot of times these will have some allegorical or mythological scenes uh, embedded within them as well. So ancient aliens uh, viewers be warned. They would also make some commemorative artworks. And these would be paintings that are produced to commemorate certain events, battles, or treaties and these types of works serve to document history. And history is written by the victors, right? So the history is always from the perspective of the ruling class. So this is also often going to be propaganda that is 
made to legitimize and glorify the reign of the current uh, monarchy in power. They'd also have an advisory role. So when a monarch or nobility has to figure out what painting to buy or what painting to send to somebody, because like a painting can be like a diplomatic offering sometimes as well. So they would go and ask the court painter, should I buy this? Is this a good painting? More or less, because they have no taste. But um, yeah, that would be another role that they would have to have. Uh, as well as instruction, of course. They would have to teach other painters how to paint. That would be part of the role. So there'd be an educational component. Uh, you need to train the next group of young artists to create paintings as well. And the last would be, kind of I touched on before, but artistic representation abroad. So they'd have to represent the artistic interests of the court in diplomatic missions or while acquiring artworks from abroad. So a court painter might be involved in negotiating commissions with foreign artists or overseeing the production of artworks that were intended for the court. So they come up with this idea, they have to get money for these things, right? You know, they have to get go to the quarry, they got to pay people to go to the quarry, to get the rock, to pull it back there. You know, every step of the process involves money of some sort. So somebody has to oversee all this sort of thing. Somebody has to be kind of a director. Oh, I want that piece of stone, you know, take it out of the quarry and then bring it back here and get these guys to, you know, start chipping away at it. Uh, somebody has to oversee that process. So it's kind of like a project manager in in many ways as well. So we can we can see a court painter as somebody who often is they're given a lot of prestige uh, within the monarchy or within the the regime in power. Uh, but they're they also have to negotiate their own vision within that. And a lot of times, uh, we have to remember, a lot of times these monarchies want to be on the cutting edge. They want to be sh seen as somebody who is in the know and is creating something new and amazing as well. So artists are given a little bit of autonomy in creating these projects as well. So they've, they've got a lot of prestige, but they've also got a lot of challenges because being a court painter, it, it offers a lot of financial security, obviously, and social status, and this opportunity to work on a grand scale. But you also have to navigate court politics, you know, fulfill the specific tastes and demands of a monarch or patrons or the Pope, right? The Pope comes and is like, I don't know about all these naked people. Can we put some leaves up there? You know, that's that's what happens. So sometimes you have to adhere to strict guidelines and sometimes you don't have to. So you're you're already in in a tough spot as an artist or as what we think of as an artist today. So this is the scene that's set as a young Fragonard begins studying with Boucher, somebody who is actually a court painter. He comes into a system of creating these types of work for aristocracy and monarchy and these types of people. And this is likely where a lot of my initial revulsion with looking at Fragonard's paintings likely stems from, is this very light and airy and beautiful and highly detailed, rosy colored pastel smeared blah, blah, blah. Okay, we're gonna make it through. Um, there are just these beautiful just painfully beautiful paintings of the ruling class. That's what it is. And that's what Fragonard makes. That's kind of what Rococo does. But, spoiler alert, it, it, it's not going to turn out well for the aristocracy in France, but we'll get to that later. So we've got a young Fragonard who's studying with Boucher, a French court painter, and he's 19 years old, and he decides there's this big prize called the Rome Art Prize, and a young Fragonard wants to compete in this competition. He wants to make a painting for this competition. So what does he submit for this competition? Rococo's going on already. He's studying with the Rococo guy, right? And he decides he's going to do a history painting. He's not going to do some fluffy aristocracy on a swing, uh, but he's going to do a history painting about kind of an obscure subject. So he, he makes this history painting that's called Jeroboam Sacrificing to the Idols. And basically what we're seeing in this painting is that Jeroboam, the first king of northern Israel, he made two golden calves and told his people they were their gods. He did this to keep his people from going to Jerusalem to worship. 
and this broke God's rule against worshiping idols. This was a big mistake and made God very, very angry and uh, would cause problems for Jeroboam's rule and Israel later on. So, Fragonard takes this really uh, obscure biblical story from the Old Testament, and he decides to make this history painting of it. And he makes it, and he wins the competition. He is the top dog all of a sudden at 20 years old. And this is a big painting. This is like four feet by five feet, basically. And it was it was highly unusual that somebody at this age of 20 would win the competition, but also this is somebody that didn't go to the prestigious Royal Academy of Painting and Sculpture, which would later acquire the painting themselves. They would actually buy this painting by somebody that didn't even go to school there, which is was highly unusual at the time. So upon receiving this prestigious award, he, he could have moved to Rome, which is the place to be for painting, because the French academies in Rome as well, which is a, an, an academy that was established by the Medici family. There's a lot of rich people involved in this story. But anyway, instead of going to Rome immediately, he decides to stay uh, and study with this guy, Charles André Van Loo. Now, this guy comes from uh, a dynasty of painters. He's got a whole family full of painters, intergenerational painters. And uh, Fragonard is like, I want to I study with Van Loo. So he ends up staying and studying with Van Loo for three more years. And during this time, he, he creates a lot more of these historical paintings. That seems to be his deal. He's really into these giant grand themes, epic themes, and these historical paintings at this period. And uh, he, he studies with him for three years until 1756, when he would finally move to Rome to start studying at the French Academy in Rome. That was then presided by this guy, Charles Joseph Natoire. And it was during this time, during his study in Rome, where he would really dig his heels in to a lot of these classical and historical themes. So we have to imagine Rome is where, you know, it's the, the home of all these great painters. So he's surrounded by all these beautiful paintings with these unbelievably epic and often religious themed works. So that, that continues in his work. One thing that does change, though, is that he develops this keen interest in landscape painting during his stay there as well. So he becomes very inspired by the Italian countryside and the work of early masters like uh, Claude Lorraine. And Fragonard starts producing landscapes that combined these classical elements with this really unbelievable observation of nature. And there's one thing, you know, all my biases about Fragonard aside, that man can paint a tree. You know, he he's just an unbelievable painter of nature. So it is here where he starts making these landscape paintings that are highly observational and uh, they're just beautiful, highly detailed looks at the natural world itself. Now, during his time there as well, of course, he would be influenced by all these masters, Raphael, Michelangelo, Caravaggio, and all the, all of these, you know, great uh, epic painters. So he's he's starting to see himself as being part of this this uh, lineage of great master painters. Also during this time, he starts playing around with drawing and etching, and he produces a ton of prints. So he's, he's exploring new mediums, he's learning about etching, he's learning more about drawing, and he's creating these etchings and these prints as well. So while Fragonard might be best known for his contributions to the Rococo style, his Roman experience really enriched his art in added layers of classical influence and a broader thematic range that would inform his work long after his return to France would come. So we can kind of look at his time in Rome as, as a time that he really, he got into the, the highest level. Uh, often, oftentimes we think of the highest level of painting as history painting because we have multiple figures, we have the landscape, and we have these grand historical narratives. And he's looking at all the best of them. And he's, he's looking at and really admiring the masters of the Dutch and Flemish schools as well, people like Rubens, uh, Rembrandt, Roysdale, and these types of people, and he's imitating their very, very loose and vigorous brush strokes in the creation of his work. We can also think about the the, the artist T. 
Tiepolo. Look up Tiepolo if you can on your phone and look at some images of him, and you'll see this very, very loose gestural approach to painting. And Fragonard is really interested in this approach to painting. It's not something that's meticulously and slowly made. His, his paintings have this luscious uh, gesture about them. And when we look at a Fragonard composition, there's often this really luscious, scent, luscious, there's really this very luscious sense of movement in the overall composition that is created. And we can look at somebody like Tiepolo and see the same sort of gestural composition that just flows beautifully across the entire canvas. So he, he stays in Rome for quite a while, and then he returns to Paris in 1761. So he's 29 years old at the time now, and he goes back to Paris, and he starts work on this large painting, another historical painting, called Caracas Sacrificing Himself to Save Calaroa. And what we're seeing in this painting is that basically the inhabitants of this ancient Greek city ask the oracle Dodana, how they might end the plague that has fallen upon their population. And the oracle replies that they have to kill, uh, sacrifice this young, beautiful girl named Calaroa, or, you know, find somebody else who can die for her. Uh, so at the climax of this story, the victim is brought to the temple where the head priest, who is a man named Caracas, who has always loved Calaroa, has the task of slaying her to save the entire city. And Fragonard's painting depicts Crasis plunging a knife into his own body, sacrificing himself to save Calaroa, who has fainted before him. And this painting uh, goes over very, very well. And the Academy in France, so there's, you have to remember, there's the Royal Academy. This is the official Royal Academy in France. There, there's a way to get in, and uh, it's only through the people in charge of the academy. But the people in the academy, in the Royal Academy in France, are like, this is a great painting. Fragonard, you're finally welcome to join us. Even though you didn't study with us, you can come and join the Royal Academy. And the painting itself gets the notice of somebody else, somebody else who is quite important, and that is King Louis the 15th. And he buys the painting, and he wants reproductions of this painting made as well. But the subject matter in these paintings is not something that really gets Louis the Fifteenth going. He's not really into all these epic stories and paintings of a guy stabbing himself in the heart in order to save a beautiful woman. He wants paintings of rich people doing beautiful, nice activities. And the acceptance by King Louis would forever color the way we look at all of Fragonard's work from that point on. Now, in looking at a lot of Fragonard's work, we can see that there's there's an edge. There's a bit of an edge to him always. And this is probably something that Louis XV really, really liked because he could exploit that edge for something that he was really interested in, and that was sex. He really loved these hidden meanings and undertones of sex and seduction within works. And for whatever reason, I, I can't imagine how explicit Louis the Fifteenth or his court would have been with somebody like Fragonard. But Fragonard certainly he 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 changes from looking at these grand historical themes to looking at these small encounters of people engaged in uh, courtship, for lack of a better word. So let's look at one of the most famous paintings of Fragonard's dealing with this subject matter, and that is Blind Man's Bluff, painted in 1750. And in this painting, we see a young man and a young woman. The woman is blindfolded, but she appears to be kind of peeking out from underneath the blindfold, giving us the idea that she's somehow in on what's going on. And next to her is a man who's gently, I don't know what we would say, gently caressing her face with what appears to be a twig or like a piece of straw or something like that, gently stroking her face with this straw. And at her feet, there's a baby, and there's another baby hiding in the bushes as well. So when we look at these characters, we might look at them now and think, wow, they, she's got a beautiful dress on. Look at that gorgeous dress. But one thing that's kind of odd about this painting is that the clothing that the people are wearing in it 
are actually what like peasants would wear. This is kind of the rustic peasant clothing. But the way that Fregonard paints it, he makes it appear unbelievably beautiful. So this could be an instance where the bourgeoisie is kind of playing dress up and slumming it as a poor person in some respects. It could also be a romanticization of, you know, the lower classes and these sorts of things. Because if we look at her shoes, we, we look at the, the woman's shoes, we notice they have these little bows on them. So it's not something you're going to wear out into the countryside. Everything she, else she has on is kind of countrysidey, but her shoes, eh, they kind of, the, the shoes always give it away, right? Surrounding these two figures, we have this dense foliage, this beautiful scenery all around them. And that, it, that in and itself almost seems like it's fake. It seems hyper real. It doesn't seem like it's an authentic look at a pastoral landscape, but rather something that's set up. And that adds to the Hallmark card nature of this, the kind of schmaltziness that I'm kind of averse to. But I'm, I'm going to work on it. I'm getting over it. I'm getting over it as I go. So in this painting, we see this interaction between a young man and a young woman, and there's all, all these sorts of um, allusions to sex. And this wasn't uncommon for Rococo. Rococo has a lot of soft porn in it, basically. Another painting, uh, 1750 or so, we have Fragonard painting uh, the shirt, taking off a shirt. Let's just, let's translate it as that. Woman taking off her shirt. And in there we just see uh, a voluptuous woman in a bed and she's she's taking off her shirt and her head is slightly tilted, not looking at the viewer. And so we're kind of like a voyeur in this sort of sense, looking at her, and we can kind of see her butt crack uh, towards the bottom of the mattress as well. So we're getting a little soft core here, uh, but it fits with Rococo, and it, and it fits with what King Louis and all the rest of them are into. Nonetheless, these, these paintings aren't really considered groundbreaking as the paintings which came before, but Fragonard's kind of hitting his stride with the whole love and sensuality thing. But there are some indications of fractures which begin to occur. And for a, for a brief amount of time, Fragonard wants to go back to, well, not go back to, because neoclassicism is happening at the same time. So he kind of wants to be, try his hand at neoclassicism. So what is neoclassicism? It's basically uh, looking back to artwork of antiquity and myth and creating works of art based upon that. This is something that Fragonard's obviously into because previously when he was a kid, he was making these grand historical paintings and now he's making these kind of flirtatious paintings of rich people slumming it up. Nonetheless, nobody cares. Nobody really pays attention to it. And then in 1769, he, he gets married and he marries a painter. As well, he marries a woman who's a very famous painter of miniatures done in the Rococo style as well. So we can imagine they have a lot of paintings in their house and they have a couple kids together and he's doing the whole family thing. Everything's great. His daughter actually ends up becoming one of his favorite models. Anyway, two years previous, he, he would have painted at this point... Fragonard is an established painter. He, he doesn't really have to worry about finances. He's got everything kind of set up. He's got this rich group of patrons and collectors who love his work. And in 1767, he does his most famous painting uh, that is called The Swing. It's generally referred to as The Swing. And if you look into any art history book in the Rococo se section of the book, you will see this painting of The Swing by Fragonard. And uh, it was originally titled The Happy the Happy Accidents of the Swing. And we'll get into why, what exactly was the happy accident in this painting. Well, the happy accident in this painting is, is a guy that gets to look up a woman's dress as she swings up and down on a swing. And once again, we're presented with an extremely lush pastoral environment. And there is one man who's kind of lying literally lying in the bushes and there there's another dude in the back who's you know making her swing back and forth and she's throwing her shoe off so we're doing that same undress thing right the same one with woman taking off her shirt uh we're, we're seeing it in this as well this woman's like whoop 
You know, she's throwing her shoe off as she's swinging up, and the guy's getting a glimpse of her undies as she swings up into the air. And his face is just like, right? So that's what's going on. We've got we've got some sculptures that are kind of in decay. I didn't really get into who who's in the sculptures. I'm sure there's some, you know, representation of goddesses or something like that. But we, we get those neoclassicism uh, sprinkles in the painting as well with these sort of classical sculptures in the background. And if you're looking for a deeper meaning in this painting there there really isn't much of one that i'm aware of i'm not sure what it is and this painting was criticized for for being too frivolous even back you know the enlightenment is beginning to come up right we're gonna have the enlightenment that we're gonna have to deal with philosophers we're gonna have to deal with french philosophers looking at a painting of a woman on a swing and a guy looking at her underwear right and they're going to also think that this painting is frivolous. Like, what are you painting? Why are you focused on this frivolity when we have real issues that can be painted? You should be painting, uh, what was it, Jeroboam, for God's sakes. Why aren't you painting Jeroboam? Or why aren't you talking about myths? Or why aren't you talking about what's happening in France at the time? Because what is happening in France at the time? Nobody knows? Okay, so... Remember the academy that uh, the the Royal Academy that Fregonard was finally uh, inducted into, that took all that work and all sorts of stuff. That's going to get destroyed, right? As as the French Revolution comes in, all these aristocrats are going to get the choppy chop on the block. Okay, they're going to cut their heads off. Literally, they're going to cut their heads off. So he's making paintings of the people that the broader French society is going to rise up and actually chop off their heads. Let that sink in for a moment. So we've got the happy accidents of the swing. And this is painted around 1767. The The French Revolution is 1789. So we have some time. And um, in that time period, Fregonard's doing great. He's traveling all over. He goes to Dresden. He comes to Prague. Good place to visit, Prague, by the way. Um, but he travels around. He's a well-known, established artist with all of these great patrons, and um, it, he's doing really, really well. In in 1789, all the decadence, this aristocratic decadence, this frivolity and excess is going to be the polar opposite of the virtues and the ideals of those interested in the French Revolution. The new political and social climate is going to value themes of heroism, virtue, uh, civic duty. And this is epitomized by the neoclassical style, something that Fragonard wanted to play with, but King Louis was like, no, make a painting of the woman on the swing. And so this had gained in popularity even before the revolution begins. And this was already a reaction to Rococo's perceived superficiality. Another thing that the, the revolution would do is it's going to completely disrupt the patronage system. It's hard to get paid for a painting when the when your collector or your patron had their head cut off, right? So many of Fragonard's patrons were from nobility, and all of this was dismantled during the revolution. And the social upheaval and economic instability is going to further decrease the demand for the kind of art that Fragonard produced. His uh, initial recognition and legacy post-revolution is is going to just fall off a cliff, like all the other Rococo artists. And he's going to be somewhat overlooked for 50 years. And during this time, he's not going to make much money. So he went from, you know, hanging out with the richest people in society, with kings and literal kings and queens, and painting them and traveling all over. And then nobody's going to be interested in, in him anymore. So he's going to struggle with financial difficulties, and he's just going to get a lot fewer commissions. He's not going to get people who want, that want their portrait painted. So basically what Fragonard does at this point is he's going to try to adapt and change his approach to painting to, to meet more neoclassical demands at the time. And this just wouldn't work. It just doesn't work. People aren't buying it, and... Uh, He's just not recognized anymore. He's lost his patrons. The The artistic preferences of the broader populace is no longer interested in him. Even worse yet, they're, they're repulsed by his work because it's representative of the aristocracy and all that they hated before. So in the immediate aftermath of the revolution, he's he's kind of considered a pariah in many respects. 
So he he goes back to Paris. He he tries to adapt, but it just doesn't work. And he's going to live with his family during his final years and really rely heavily upon the support of his son, uh, Alexandra, who's also an artist. And his son would become a pretty well-known neoclassical painter at the time, and he would make good money doing it. So he's now taking care of his dad. And then uh, in 1806, in Paris, Fragonard would die, and he would be largely forgotten by the public and his art patrons. And at the time of his death, the artistic landscape of France had transformed significantly, and neoclassicism has firmly established itself as the dominant style. Now, around 70 years later, 80 years later, in the late 19th century, Fragonard's work would be rediscovered and celebrated for its vibrancy, technical skill, and the embodiment of the Rococo spirit. And today, he's regarded as one of the major figures of 18th century French art. These later years of Fragonard's life really highlight the vulnerability of artists to the shifting sands of political, social, and aesthetic changes. Despite the obscurity that he faced towards the end of his life, uh, his, his legacy still endures and his works continue to captivate audiences with their charm, exuberance, and beauty. And we could even say frivolity, because what's wrong with what what really is wrong with the painting of a woman kicking off her shoe, right? Should we really get that worried about it? And that really goes to the heart of where we began this podcast. Did, am I a convert? Am I a Fragonard convert? Kind of. I guess I kind of am, because I can I can really see where his place in art history is. When I look at the images, it's not something that moves me necessarily. It's not something that resonates with me. However, I understand its importance, and I understand why it's situated exactly where it is historically, and why it's such a great embodiment of that time. And that's what art appreciation is really all about. It's looking at a work, not, oh, I like it. I like the colors. They're nice. I like purple. You know, it's more about placing that work in history. And it's hard to deny that there was a better Rococo artist who could paint the excess of the aristocracy better than Fragonard. Thanks a lot for listening. And if you're feeling overwhelmed by endless critiques of your artwork and you're craving a space where your creativity is not just welcomed but celebrated along the freedom to explore art's rich history, if this sounds like a dream, well, let me introduce you to Oko Academy, which is my tiny little art school nestled in the heart of Prague. And uh, this is a place where expression takes center stage and we offer a wide array of lessons tailored to nurture your unique talents. From mastering the basics to diving deep into art historical themes, whether you're looking to polish your skills or embark on a journey through the annals of art history, Oko Academy is your sanctuary. Join us where your art will flourish in an environment built on support, freedom, and a deep love of the arts. For more information, head on over to oko.academy. Thanks a lot for listening, everyone, and as always, happy painting.